Our subject tonight, why software matters to government intelligence, could not be more topical and important. And our guest is uniquely positioned to help us grapple with the connection between software, computing, intelligence work, and big issues facing us nationally and globally. The intimate connection between computing history and intelligence dates back to the very origins of the electronic digital computer, information theory, and the computer industry itself. Dr. Jason Matheny is the director of IARPA, the Intelligence Advanced Research Projects Activity of the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. IARPA's mandate is to fund high-risk, high-return R&D programs of potential benefit to the men and women of the nation's intelligence community. Jason has been with IARPA since 2009 in various roles. Before that, he held a variety of research and policy positions in industry, academia, and NGOs, including the World Bank, Princeton, and Oxford. He was also the founder of New Harvest, a biotechnology nonprofit aimed at what it calls cellular agriculture. Jason earned his PhD in applied economics and a master's of public health at Johns Hopkins and an MBA from Duke. Please join me in welcoming Jason Matheny to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Well, Jason, thanks again for joining us tonight. And um, for those in the audience who may have trouble keeping track of it all, could you describe for us just who makes up the US intelligence community? Uh, the range of their responsibilities, and where the Office of the Director of National Intelligence fits into that whole picture. Yeah, there are 17 organizations that make up uh, the intelligence community, so it's a lot to keep track of. Um, and that includes the organizations that you all have probably heard of, like CIA, NSA, NRO, uh, but also includes some organizations that you may not have, have thought of being associated with national intelligence. Uh, so the Department of Treasury, for instance, has uh, an intelligence component. The State Department has an intelligence component. Um, the goal of the office, the director of national intelligence, is to help integrate all of that intelligence such that it can be made available to decision makers when they need it. And um, could you talk about some of the responsibilities that these various agencies in the intelligence community have, what they're, the job that they're tasked so, doing. so broadly to make sense of a very complex world. Um, and they do that by collecting information about the world, both through unclassified means and through classified means. So uh, first looking at the things that aren't secrets and then looking at the things that are secrets and mysteries. Um, and then trying to analyze uh, those pieces of information that are often errorful, often contradictory, often constantly changing. Uh, in order to make sense both of events as they exist today and as uh, they might exist tomorrow. Um, and that is a very challenging job. Um, the nature of unpredictability, of uncertainty um, in our world, I think, has changed over the last few decades. Um, we used to have sort of a, a single state competitor that we worried about as a nation uh, that was uh, in a strategic arms race with us. Uh, now we live in a multipolar world that's much more competitive in more dimensions, economically, uh, strategic, militarily. Um, and that has made the business of intelligence um, much more difficult, much more complex. Can you tell us uh, about uh, why IARPA was created and how it works and um, how you came to direct it? So IARPA was stood up 10 years ago in order to uh, advance research and development for intelligence missions. And there was a, an understanding that in order to achieve our national intelligence goals, we had to develop advanced technologies faster. Uh, we had to avoid technological surprise um, where it mattered most. Um, and we needed uh, to leverage the extraordinary uh, intellectual capital that exists within universities, colleges, uh, and industry in a way that the intelligence community had not been leveraging um, mm -hmm. up to that point. So IARPA was really created in order to serve as an extramural 
uh, funder of research and development in academia and industry uh, to get the world's brightest scientists and engineers from around the world to work on our hardest problems. The way that I got involved um, is, um, is taking a pretty untraditional path from public health to national intelligence. Uh, not one that I would have predicted. I would have been a bad intelligence analyst um, for, my, for, for predicting my own events. Um, so I, uh, I had been working mostly on global infectious diseases uh, for about a decade after I came out of, uh, out of college. I worked mostly on tuberculosis and malaria, um, diseases that kill millions of people each year. Um, and I was focused on finding uh, cost-effective ways to reduce the, um, the burden uh, of those diseases, um, particularly in developing countries. Um, when I was working on a project in India um, in 2003, I was working with a group of epidemiologists who had been part of the smallpox eradication campaign. Mm -hmm. um, and some of you all, maybe um, about half of you all, are probably too young to have ever been vaccinated against smallpox. And that's because these people successfully eradicated that disease so that we didn't have to be uh, vaccinated against smallpox. Uh, but in 2003, the first virus was created from scratch mm -hmm. um, from its chemical constituents. It sort of brought biology much closer to being an art like computer science um, in that you could write code, you could boot up that code using uh, chemistry, and then you could create um, a new organism. Um, the prospect of somebody then recreating smallpox uh, was introduced for the, for the first time. And most of the epidemiologists that I worked with thought, you know, we've spent decades eradicating this disease that now somebody could cook up again. Mm -hmm. um, what worried me was that somebody might cook up something worse than smallpox, something that um, we would be uh, unprepared for. So I then moved from working on natural infectious diseases to working on, on national security around uh, uh, biodefense. And I realized how many of the challenges that we have in, um, in global security and in global health really come down to having information or not having information. Hmm. Um, in, in my work in public health, thousands of people would die when we didn't have information about where uh, diseases were prevalent. Um, or where we didn't have uh, antibiotics, um, or in the case of malaria, bed nets. And that lack of information was something that just had a concrete cost in human lives that we could count. And the same is true in national intelligence. Um, the goal there is to provide information where we need it in order to make better decisions, to reduce uncertainty uh, so that we can avoid often catastrophic errors. Uh, so that's what brought me to, um, to IRPA, and a big part of my work there has focused uh, on these continuing challenges in biosecurity, which mm -hmm. I think we'll talk a bit about later. Yes, I'd like to. Um, it's interesting that, you know, IARPA's programs are uh, essentially conducted by and large in the open. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of publications come out from these IARPA programs. There's a lot of partnerships with uh, academics at a whole variety of institutions, consortia of researchers, and it strikes me as, you know, a pretty profound decision. You know, do you want to do this sort of R&D work in the open, or do you want to do it in not in the open, <laughs> uh, which I think must have been a choice. And does IARPA reflect a certain uh, commitment to seeing a value in doing this sort of work more or less in the open? Yeah, the vast majority of, of work that we fund is in the open. Um, it's, it's unclassified, it's conducted internationally. Uh, there aren't restrictions on publications, and that's for a few different reasons. So one is, that's how you get the best science. Hmm. Um, uh, I, I'm a strong believer in Bill's jo Bill Joy's law, the smartest people usually work for somebody else. Um, and that's, that's true. That's true for us. Um, it's true for virtually any organization. Um, so if you want the smartest people to be working on your problem, you have to make that problem accessible to them. Um, so we have to be able to translate classified problems into unclassified problems or surrogates or proxies uh, in order for um, Nobel laureates and field medalists and others to be able to work on them. 
Um, the, there's another benefit, uh, which is um, peer review, mm -hmm. which is incredibly important as a, a check on the rigor of science. Um, if, if you have classified research that has a small number of reviewers, usually from the same organization, <laughs> there's just a much greater likelihood that um, bad science uh, will persist. Mm -hmm. Um, when you open it up to the inspection and critique of a much broader community, you're just going to um, get sounder critiques quicker than you otherwise would. You'll be able to uh, debunk bad findings uh, more quickly and more cheaply. Uh, there's a third reason, which is that um, many of our most pressing national intelligence problems um, don't have um, enemies. Uh, that is, I mean, we, we, we don't have intelligent adversaries when it comes to things like uh, economic recessions um, or, um, or global disease. Um, so we don't have to worry about publishing research, for example, on economic instability or publishing research on uh, biosecurity risks of certain types mm -hmm. uh, because there aren't intelligent adversaries who are reading journals and then planning how to create um, you know, a, a new pathogen. In some cases there are, and we do have to worry about those, and those are cases where we may make certain aspects of the research classified. Uh, but in many cases, um, we're dealing with uh, challenges uh, that are accidental or that are natural or that are emergent properties of a highly interdependent complex world. Hmm. Were there examples for IARPA to follow in this kind of uh, open research paradigm? Th that is to say, somebody had showed the value of this kind of approach for uh, research and development activity, you know, uh, very important to national security. It, was there a model that you were following? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, so there were, um, there were multiple models for the, the stand-up of IARPA that, um, uh, one was DARPA, uh, uh -huh. which, uh, which formed the basis for how IARPA was organized, um, both with this sort of extramural funding model, as well as the idea of having term-limited program managers who are themselves outstanding scientists and engineers. They come inside government um, for three to five years to have a multiplier effect on their uh, on their research, um, a commitment to testing and evaluation, um, research with a, with a goal in mind, um, and uh, a sort of aversion to institutionalizing programs. So you run a program in order to um, uh, push as hard as you can on a particular problem. Um, if you fail, you don't keep funding it. <laughs> uh, you, take, uh, you take the money from things that were failing and you stop. <laughs> uh, and you take that money and you put it into something new. Um, so the ability to cut funding, I think, is something that's, um, uh, that's a really strong part of the DARPA model that we inherited. Um, a lot of our original staff were from DARPA. We continue to play musical chairs with DARPA. <laughs> a lot of our program managers go over there. A lot of their program managers come to IARPA. Um, so that's a big part of it. I think another big part of, um, of IARPA uh, was from the intelligence community itself. I mean, um, you know, most people when they, um, when they hear about IARPA imagine something like Q Branch from the James Bond movies. <laughs> and th that's how I originally sold it to my family. Yeah. Like, it's going to be just like Q Branch. I'm going to be with a white lab coat. I'm going to be saying, Very nice snarky. cars. Yes, nice <laughs> cars. Don't push all the buttons, though, trust me. Um, one of them is an ejection seat. Um, and I'll get to say like lots of snarky stuff to secret agents and get away right. with it. Um, and then they have, you know, like bring your family to work day. And my family sees that it's like this nondescript office building with a bunch of filing cabinets full of research contracts. So now what I try to go with um, is I say like this is way better than Q Branch because we've crowdsourced Q. <laughs> They're, they're not yeah, as interesting. No, I, I wouldn't yeah, think so. It, no. it hasn't worked. Um, well, maybe we could get into a description of some of the range of projects that um, IARPA is pursuing today, and I think you've brought some materials to, to show us to talk about some of these programs. Yeah, great. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, IARPA's uh, research, uh, some of the things that we're best known for are, are investments in computing, um, in machine learning, in neuroscience, human judgment. Um, to highlight um, one program called Microns, which was started by Jacob Fogelstein um, and David Markowitz, uh, the goal of the program is to understand how the brain computes. 
And the brain really is an extraordinary computing device uh, in that it operates off of about 20 watts, um, you know, depending how much you've eaten during a day. <laughs> yeah. uh, so if it's pre-dinner time for most of you, uh, it's still 20 watts. Um, and the ability for that device um, to do what no 20 megawatt supercomputer can do today, which is to learn from sparse data, uh, to make inferences and do sense making on highly complex data sets. Uh, and it comes down to these kinds of structures, these synaptic structures. Uh, and the goal of the um, IARPA Microns program is to reverse engineer these cortical circuits. What you're seeing right now is uh, work by uh, Jeff Lickman's lab at Harvard uh, where they have used electron uh, microscopy in order to resolve each of these slices um, of neurons, dendrites, axons, synapses, uh, so that you can recover that wiring diagram in rich detail. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you go to the next video, uh, which comes from Sebastian Sung's lab at Princeton, uh, what Sebastian has done is to create this sort of human-based computation approach to doing image recognition within these very complex fields uh, of neurons. Um, so he has, he's sort of turned it into like a video game where participants at home can actually participate and help to label um, what are neurons and what is the matter outside of neurons mm. so that you can develop a training set and then ultimately automate the, uh, the development of these, of these rich graphs. Um, this, this work has yielded um, the largest data set uh, to date of these kinds of uh, cortical circuits, 10 times larger than anything that existed before. Um, within a year from now, we expect it'll be 1,000 times larger still. Um, and from that, I think we'll have a much richer understanding of how the brain computes so efficiently. Hmm. Fascinating. So uh, from this kind of um, brain science and neuromorphic uh, computing, um, I believe that the, the next example um, for which you brought media is, is more uh, where software itself is the technology That's right. under consideration. So, so one way of thinking of this is this is the simplest model of the brain that has fueled uh, the, the most recent revolution in machine learning, mm. uh, which are these uh, deep neural nets. And neural, I mean, the idea for neural nets goes back decades, and it was very loosely based on what, during sort of the 1950s, was how we pictured the brain actually worked. Um, and we have gotten enormous mileage from this, especially in the last several years, uh, thanks to GPUs right. and thanks to large labeled data sets. Um, so if you, if you go back to this video, you'll sort of see the power of these um, neural nets in action um, it was labeling videos based on the, the activities actually occurring within the videos. So unlike most video searches that you might do, uh, say, using YouTube or Google Video Search or uh, Microsoft Video Search, what this is actually looking for is not the tag within the video, but the activity within a video based on the sequences of images that it sees. Um, I think that's, that's extraordinary, showing the power of fairly primitive neural nets. Um, so the, the next question is, well, what happens when you take something that's not just loosely neuro-inspired, but really neuromimetic, mm. uh, that's able to leverage the kinds of capabilities that we actually use in the, in the brain? Um, so we have a kind of machine learning software for uh, identifying events in video, uh, brain science. Um, I know that some of the programs span into various forms of kind of chemical and biological detection. Um, are there uh, any other examples that you have that show the, the kind of range of concerns of the agency? Yeah, um, so we, uh, we fund uh, work in computer science, mathematics, uh, sociology, psychology. Um, in the words of one of our staff members, we fund everything from AI to Zika, <laughs> which is literally true. We co-fund some research with Microsoft uh, developing um, a new kind of smart mosquito trap that you can use for disease surveillance, uh, which is being deployed for uh, Zika biosurveillance. Um, but some of the work that I think is, is probably um, likely to resonate here that we do in machine learning um, focuses on problems that industry itself might not go after because mm. there's not much of a market for it. 
Uh, one is in the case of low resource languages, languages that have very few speakers okay. on the planet, but that could be of importance to national security. You want to be able to translate from those languages. You want to be able to do speech recognition in those languages. If you take a system like Siri or Amazon Echo, which takes years to train and develop, we can't afford to do that for every new language that becomes important. So we have a program called Babel that took as its goal to uh, reduce the training time for a new language for a speech recognition system from about you know, nine months to a year down to about five days. Mm. And it, it, it achieved that, <laughs> um, in part by identifying sort of those deep structural features of languages that are conserved across language families. And now we're doing the same for machine translation. Um, another example of things that the intelligence community needs is the ability to very accurately render um, 2D uh, images into 3D models that are accurate um, for buildings. Okay. Um, so if you take a problem like uh, the Abbottabad uh, compound right. uh, that Osama bin Laden was living in, uh, it took a long time to build an accurate rendering of that compound from overhead imagery. How can we do that in minutes or seconds even um, when we need to? Um, and then also, how can you identify where a particular photograph or video was taken based on features within it if it wasn't hand-tagged? Usually in intelligence, we're, um, we're not fortunate enough to have users who fat-fingered in the tag. Like, <laughs> ISIL doesn't do much tagging of its videos. <laughs> right. So we have to find other ways of identifying where videos were taken, um, what those videos are about so that you don't need human eyeballs on every video. So being able to automatically detect, um, say, in a, a video footage, whether somebody's dropping a bag or handing a bag off so that you can do real-time tipping and queuing mm. of uh, an analyst or security officer. Um, in preparing for this evening, it really struck me that all of the IARPA programs are fundamentally reliant on computing. Um, many of the you know, programs, such as a few that we've discussed, are aimed at producing software or new computing capabilities. And there are some that are devoted to developing what I would call like new forms of computing itself. Uh, there's uh, programs in superconducting electronics and superconducting uh, conventional computers. And then there's a large program on quantum computing. So first, is that right, this kind of fundamental role of computing in all of this? And um, if it if that is right, why is that? It, it is right, and I think um, one, of, uh, one of the reasons is that um, intelligence is about data, um, and the, um, the limits of our ability to compute on certain kinds of data are becoming apparent. And we can tell hmm. that 10 to 20 years from now, we need to move to new forms of computing uh, in order to be able to analyze the volumes of data that, that we have as a society. Um, so we, we invest heavily in machine learning and data science, uh, but we also invest on the hardware side, yeah. um, on the computing machinery. Uh, we were called out uh, in an executive order uh, as being a foundational R&D organization for something called the National Strategic Computing Initiative, mm -hmm. uh, which aligns with our research in neuromorphic computing that I showed earlier, as well as um, our work in superconducting computing and in quantum computing. Um, superconducting computing, um, which you wrote a great piece on in the IEEE spectrum, um, is one really interesting approach to solving some of our long-term uh, computing needs. Um, in, in, in one case, um, you can reduce the energy cost of supercomputing uh, by about two orders of magnitude as well as reduce the physical footprint that you need um, for supercomputers by two orders of magnitude. Um, and the, the other advantages um, from these superconducting um, computers is that you're no longer wasting energy and moving bits between logic and memory the way you mm -hmm. are with, uh, with traditional computers. Um, so that's one area where we invest a lot through our C3 program run by Mark Mannheimer. Um, and we also uh, have a new program called Super Tools, which is aimed at de uh, design tools for 
developing extremely complex superconducting circuits. Um, our work with uh, MIT Lincoln Labs has created the world's largest foundry for superconducting microelectronics that has produced the world's most complex superconducting circuits. And I think that's a very exciting area. Um, I mean, it's, it has you know, a multi-decade history, as you correctly pointed out in your article. Um, but the, the, the pieces are all sort of coming together now in a way that I think really can enable uh, this as a new computing regime uh, for the next few decades. Um, the other area where we invest heavily is in quantum computing, which is um, this image. Uh, this is um, uh, Sandia and the University of Maryland's um, trapped ion uh, qubit, uh, which was funded under IARPA's MQCO program, uh, started by Mike Mandelberg, uh, then run by David Mooring, um, and now the successor to this program called Logical Qubits is being run by Brad Blakestad. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, you'll see a different kind of qubit. Um, this is a, um, uh, a five uh, trapped ion uh, qubit uh, from the University of Maryland at Crispin Rose Lab. Uh, this, I think, was the first um, programmable quantum computer that you could actually get to run something like Shor's algorithm. Um, granted, not at you know large scale. This is uh, this is just. Uh, five qubits, um, and in order to do really useful things with quantum computers, you would need hundreds or thousands of qubits. But this is starting to develop those basic building blocks that you would need for much larger systems. May I interrupt you just slightly? For people who may have heard the term quantum computing before, could you explain um, just what, uh, what IARPA sees in this area and what sort of um, computing problem that this new form of computing might solve that might not otherwise be addressable by the kind of computers we have today? So the, the great virtue of a quantum computer is that unlike a classical computer that whose logical bit can um, only take on uh, two states, a, a quantum bit uh, can take on uh, multiple states at the same time. Um, and this allows it to do things that classical computers can't. Um, the, the most famous application is in cryptography and that you could factor very large numbers uh, quickly. Um, so this is one area where you just don't want to be surprised because if uh, quantum computers make a lot of progress very quickly, we would have to turn over um, all of our factor-based encryption systems to some sort of post-quantum cryptography. Um, so one reason we invest in this is just to understand how quickly this field is accelerating. Um, and I think, you know, we're, we've got some decades left before <laughs> we've got a, a practical quantum computer that could do large-scale factoring. But there are near-term applications of quantum computing that are also um, highly powerful. So one is that you can do certain kinds of optimization yeah. uh, with quantum computers. Uh, more quickly than you can with classical computers. And this has applications to scheduling problems. It has applications uh, to search and applications to machine learning. Uh, so doing things like uh, Boltzmann machines more efficiently uh, using a quantum computer. Uh, so we, we invest in a, a variety of different kinds of quantum computing approaches. Um, it's, it's a bit like a horse race. You're not exactly sure who's going to win. So you sort of cover your bets. Right. Um, and trapped ions, like the picture here, is certainly one of them. Uh, you'll see a few of the other bets that we've made. OK. And the next slide. Um, so this is a neutral atom uh, qubit out of the University of Wisconsin. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is a quantum dot out of uh, Copenhagen. Next slide. So these are all contenders for forming the qubit, which is a, the kind of the transistor of quantum computing. That's right. That's okay. exactly right. Yeah. So these are these are the logical building blocks of of what a larger scale system would look like. Um, and I mean, one thing is they're just beautiful artifacts. <laughs> um, I mean, we've started making you know posters for our offices out of these things because they're like more interesting than most modern art <laughs> yeah. that you could pick. Uh, and cheaper, because we've got the rights to them. <laughs> uh, this is an ion trap from Sandia. Next slide. Uh, this is a superconducting qubit from um, John Martinez's lab at the um, UC Santa Barbara uh, that now works with, uh, with Google. 
Uh, and Google is, is doing great work in, um, in scaling up uh, this particular qubit approach. Next slide. I think this is the last one. This is a, a seven qubit, a superconducting qubit from IBM. Um, IBM, with our funding, has now made a, um, uh, a, a version of their um, low qubit quantum computer available to the public <laughs> so that anybody in the public can program it. So if you um, uh, search for quantum experience, IBM, uh, you can learn how to program a quantum computer and get a head start on everybody else. <laughs> um, well, I, I think a subject that often gets overlooked in discussions about um, technology and intelligence or national security is um, analysis. Um, Rightfully, a lot of attention gets paid to issues around surveillance and privacy. Um, and what's frequently overlooked is the role that analysts, people, <laughs> men and women working in the intelligence community play and the challenges that they face, as we were talking about earlier, in making sense of events and threats and connecting the dots, as it were. Um, so could you talk a little bit about the role of analysts and the software and other computing technologies that IARPA is pursuing um, kind of directly for these people? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question um, because um, I think another reason um, for me to sort of avoid uh, the Q branch analogy, um, I mean, not only um, to, to stop feeling like my family pulled a, a bait and switch, but the, the other reason is that um, uh, it really does come down to human judgments. I mean, you can get as many fancy gadgets as you want, um, but ultimately it's a human analyst who's defending a judgment to a policymaker uh, or another decision maker about why they think the world is in a particular state or not. Um, and those human judgments um, are vulnerable to certain kinds of bias. Uh, they're vulnerable to certain kinds of errors. But I am continually amazed by the quality and conscientiousness of intelligence analysts in these agencies. Um, and one of the tracks of research that we have at IARPA is to invest uh, quite a lot in work on cognitive psychology, human judgment, human decision making, in order to understand how to build tools that actually help analysts. Hmm. Uh, not just that do machine learning, uh, because there's some things that um, computers don't do well yet, um, and we need to find ways of helping analysts um, make better decisions um, using their own brains. Mm. Um, so we invest a lot in um, what we call forecasting tournaments, in which we have thousands, um, sometimes tens of thousands, of participants from around the world who make judgments about geopolitical events, and we keep score uh, the largest of these at its peak had about 40,000 participants who generated over 2 million judgments hmm. about geopolitical events ranging from foreign elections to weapons tests to whether a treaty would get signed by a particular date. We kept score on those forecasts to see which ones were right, which ones were wrong, who got it right, who got it wrong, what kinds of skill sets made people more accurate, what kinds of skill sets made people less accurate. There's hmm. this notion of the paradox of expertise, which is that some experts um, act, become overconfident. Um, they stop looking for information that disconfirms their beliefs. Mm. They go to a few sort of trusted sources, and that's it. Um, so what we found with this was a variety of things that were counterintuitive. One is the most accurate people were typically not the deepest domain experts, but were people who scored very highly on tests of critical thinking. Um, they were humble. Um, they changed their minds when presented with new information rather than sticking to their guns. And they did seek out sources that contradicted their intuitions. Hmm. Um, so that's uh, part of our work on cognitive psychology um, and led by people like Phil Tetlock and Barb Mellers and Don Moore. Um, now we've just recently launched a program called the Hybrid Forecasting Competition, um, it, which looks at how do you take the best of human judgments and the best of machine models and combine them or figure out ways of uh, making them more complementary. Hmm. And one analogy is made to, um, to chess. So uh, in chess, um, there's, uh, there's now a, a form of chess play called Centaur Chess, in which you team up a chess player with a chess computer. 
oh, I've heard of this. And it's striking that if you take a mediocre chess player like me <laughs> and a, a sort of you know, mediocre laptop chess computer uh, that's commercially available, you can now outperform you know, the world's best chess player or the world's best chess computer. Hmm. That this combination of, of human judgment and uh, raw compute can outperform uh, the greatest forms of either. So being able to figure out what the best complementary blend of human judgment and machine learning is something that we're going after in this hybrid forecasting competition. And anybody who wants to participate um, can go to gjopen.com, that's goodjudgmentopen.com, <laughs> and register. Um, and you can either duke it out against a machine, duke it out against another human, or team up with other humans and other machines in order to duke it out against one or the other. Um, I think what we'll learn from that is that there are things that machines do really well in geopolitical forecasting, but there are things that humans do much, much better, and that we just need to find ways of, of complementing each other. Uh, so that's one type of work that uh, we do uh, that leverages uh, a human judgment. Um, another type of, of work that we do that leverages um, uh, uh, judgments in a way that I think a, a lot of people are surprised by is we run this um, program on, um, on philosophy hmm. um, called CREATE, uh, which is looking at using crowdsourcing to create better arguments. Um, so we, we have a, a philosopher at IARPA, a, a very smart analytic philosopher who studied uh, logic uh, at Princeton. He came to IARPA, and now he runs this program in which he's running sort of the world's largest debate tournament. Um, and thousands of people are collectively constructing then arguments, and we're seeing how can you identify um, the good parts of arguments, the bad parts of arguments, in which premi faulty premises are not identified. Um, so I think this will be another valuable tool in the analytic toolkit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In, in expressing judgments. That's right. Expanding judgments. Well, um, if I could, I'd like to, to circle back to this um, topic of privacy. Uh, many of the software and other technologies that are currently being pursued by IARPA are about dramatically extending the ability to identify and locate people. And of course, when these people are an imminent threat to the life of others, um, having that kind of capacity is obviously highly desirable. Um, and yet, it simultaneously represents the capacity to erase the privacy of, in principle, anyone or any group, um, the state or whomever has the tool <laughs> so chooses. So how do you and your colleagues grapple with this um, tension or this dilemma? And um, do you do work on safeguards? We, we do, and I think what, we, what we'd like to find is something where we don't have to compromise on either privacy or security. So finding technologies that would allow us to pursue both and mm. balance them. Um, so we invest a lot in um, a technology called homomorphic encryption, hmm. um, which allows one to run an encrypted query against an encrypted database, get an encrypted answer and response, which you can then decrypt, um, I'll, I'll break this down yeah. in a way that uh, sort of gives examples of how it can be useful. Um, so let's say that um, I'm the Centers for Disease Control. I want to know how many cases of flu there are in a particular season. Um, I want to know in a particular city how many cases there are. Um, you have, say, an electronic health record. You don't necessarily want me to see your electronic health record. I don't need to see your electronic health record. I just want to know, is there a one or a zero in your row on having flu or not having the mm -hmm. flu? So in principle, the Centers for Disease Control could structure an encrypted query uh, against an encrypted database that holds your electronic health records and a bunch of others that are all encrypted. Um, I can't read those health records, but I can run this query against your data even while it remains encrypted and just know what's the sum of that particular column that lists has the flu. Um, that would be incredibly valuable because mm. we as a society could actually protect data even as it's being computed upon. Hmm. Um, and thanks to uh, work at, at IBM several years ago, we know that this is provably possible. 
uh, to run those kinds of encrypted queries against encrypted databases. It's just very slow. Hmm. Um, so it started out that it was about a trillion times slower to do an encrypted <laughs> query. So very slow. Not very slow. practical. <laughs> yeah. By the time the CDC found out how many flu cases there are, there are the flu season right. would be well yeah. over. The sun burned out or <laughs> That's something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we, we have to bring that overhead down. It's been brought down by six orders of magnitude, so now it's only a million times slower. <laughs> Uh, we think in this new program that we have uh, called Hector, uh, which is going after this problem, that we can probably uh, bring it down three to four more orders of magnitude. Uh, and then it really would become a practical approach. Uh, there's also something called um, partially homomorphic encryption, which allows you to structure queries in this way that allow you to balance privacy and security in specific cases. Um, there's things like um, uh, code obfuscation, zero knowledge proofs, uh, and something else we're doing, which is called classified as a service, we just put out a request for information on how can we use commercial cloud computing in ways that um, we're sort of protecting the compute as you go. So that if you, if you do get into a machine, you, you can't run amok. Mm. Uh, so we're, we're very interested in finding these technology solutions that would allow us to, um, to, to have sort of a non-zero sum approach to security and privacy. Mm. So this, um, pardon me if, if I, I can't remember the term for this kind of yeah. encrypted query of an encrypted... Homomorphic. Homomorphic yeah. um, search in a way. Um, you know, would that get at issues that, um, you know, we've read about in the news lately? For example, um, uh, the collection of metadata from telephone records, for example, that was, you know, very controversial um, in the news a lot and um, of concern to, for many people about privacy. Um, would this, how would this sort of solution address a problem like that? Would it give um, sort of certified users access to that information to find relevant data, but not at the same time collect the phone records of you know, every phone customer in the US. That's right. I mean, you could, you could, run, um, you could run a query against an encrypted data set um, without having access to the whole data set, and you just sort of get back a yes, no response for whether your particular search matches an entire data set. Um, and then if it does match, then you could you know, go to the courts to request access to that particular data. Mm. Um, and so this, this does narrow the kinds of data that uh, an agency would need to have access to. Um, to give one example that, in fact, motivated part of our research was, let's say an intelligence agency knows that there's a suspected terrorist who's flying on a US uh, flight, airline flight. Um, the intelligence agency may not want to give up the name of this terrorist because knowing the name may in fact rely on classified information, right. so the query itself would be classified. So it may want to run an encrypted query. TSA or an airline company doesn't want to give up the entire database um, of passengers appropriately. So um, this approach would allow an encrypted query against that encrypted database and get back a yes, no response. Mm. That's fascinating. Um, I know that um, certain agencies in the intelligence community are uh, charged with um, uh, protecting against things like um, cyber attacks and um, uh, uh, computer-based espionage. Um, are there, are there programs that IARPA is pursuing that address these, uh, what you might call um, d defensive measures or ways to um, ensure secrecy and privacy in different ways? Yes, there's a, a program that we uh, run at IARPA um, called CAUSE, um, which is focused on forecasting cyber attacks. Hmm. Um, and it's a unique interdisciplinary collaboration between computer scientists, cybersecurity experts, and social scientists who study cyber actors and their behaviors. Hmm. So Rob Raymer, who's the uh, program manager, has a large group of academic researchers and industry researchers who are doing things like looking at hacker forums for discussions of new vulnerabilities looking at the black market prices of malware 
uh, which operate like other markets. When demand goes up and the supply hasn't increased, the price goes up. So you can actually see when new uh, malware is being purchased. Oh. Um, and look for things like web search patterns that suggest that people are mapping networks, uh, help desk tickets across enterprises that might suggest penetration testing. Oh. So looking at these early indicators of cyber attacks, um, uh, most of the time, unfortunately, forensically, we're looking backwards in time and trying to figure out how a cyber attack occurred. The goal of this program is can we do this prospectively? Can we get ahead of the cyber attack? Mm -hmm. um, I guess to, to loop back one more time to, to the question of privacy, um, we, we recently had a CHM live event here at the museum with a psychologist from the Stanford Business School, uh, Michal Kaczynski. And he has become prominent for work that he's done uh, that aims to identify characteristics of people like personality traits, um, political beliefs, and so forth from uh, social media traces or data, for example, Facebook likes and profile pictures. And he believes that um, with this combination, well, with what uh, machine learning in particular is able to do with large data sets and this kind of social media data, that uh, privacy itself is effectively dead. Uh, and I think we have a clip from that, uh, if we could listen to that now. The, my conclusion is that going forward, there's going to be no privacy whatsoever. And the sooner we realize that, the, 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 the sooner we can start talking about how to make sure that this post-privacy world is still a habitable and safe and nice place to live in. And now when people say, oh no, how can you say that we should still work on technologies protecting our privacy? And I'm like, yes, let's do it. Thank but you also have to realize that this is a distraction because it somehow makes people believe that maybe we could have privacy in the future. And this belief, I believe now, is completely wrong. And now just to also stress the importance of that, we're having conversation here about how invasions of privacy, how revealing our intimate traits can be used to, let's say, manipulate us in, um, to buy products or maybe vote for, uh, for political candidates. Mm -hmm. Well, creepy makes me feel uneasy and so on. <laughs> but we have to realize that outside of our Western liberal free bubble, losing privacy can be literally a matter of life and death. Mm -hmm. Think about countries where homosexuality is punished by death. If a security officer there can take a smartphone, take a photo of someone's face, and reveal their sexual orientation, this is really, really, really bad news for, uh, uh, for gay men and women uh, all around the world. And now think about political views. Think about other intimate traits like intelligence and so on. So basically, the sooner we make sure that we act, we think, We've, we basically, as a basic and default assumption, take there's going to be no privacy in the world. How do we change the international politics? How do we make sure that lives of minorities, religious minorities, sexual minorities, political minorities in other countries are preserved even in the post-privacy uh, world? I think this is the question we should be talking about now and not how to, uh, how to change the policy to protect our privacy better. Because guess what? We already lost. We can win a battle, but we have completely lost this war already. So uh, Professor Kaczynski puts his point very, very strongly um, uh, that we're in a, you know, that we should accept that we're in a uh, post-privacy world and learn how to deal with it. I, I was very curious to, to hear from your vantage point um, you know, uh, do you think he's right? Are we in a post-privacy world? Are there, um, uh, how does it look from where you sit? Yeah, I'm, I'm not as pessimistic um, as, as he is. I think, um, I, I think the rate of de-anonymization um, in society uh, has surprised all of us, mm -hmm. um, par particularly due to 
um, uh, commercial technologies that have allowed um, aggregation of very large data sets, mostly for marketing, for advertising, um, and that are, that are shared in ways that, um, that it create, allow you to create a fairly specific profile of, of, uh, of individuals. And actually from Mikhail's other, other work, I mean, you see how, how um, powerful those data sets can be in being able to make educated guesses about you know, somebody's income, uh, somebody's um, uh, uh, location of their residence, um, yeah, what their political leanings are. Uh, and I think that is likely to continue. Um, and I think that the merger of those sorts of technologies with things like greater availability of facial recognition, of um, real-time uh, video and imagery, you know, once smart glasses become fairly ubiquitous, say, in the next decade, um, and everybody is wearing around sort of real-time facial recognition systems, uh, that, that seems as though sort of the public sphere and the private sphere um, b become much more difficult to distinguish. But I think there will always be countermeasures for that. Hmm. Um, so one area where um, we followed the research uh, quite a bit is in fairly easy ways to spoof facial recognition systems. Hmm. Um, there's a whole um, sort of subculture now within machine learning called adversarial machine learning, huh. uh, in which you look at various ways of spoofing image classifiers. And most of these systems are very brittle. Um, you know, just by you know, taking a magic marker and putting a couple dots on your forehead, you're gonna fool most facial recognition systems. Hmm. Um, and I, I think those kinds of countermeasures, for those who want it, um, I think will become increasingly sophisticated. So you'll have, well, some people will be wearing the smart eyeglasses for helping them to recognize others. Others will be having the dumbfounding eyeglasses <laughs> <laughs> to confuse the dazzler. others, the dazzler. <laughs> yeah. um, and I, I think we'll, we'll also find that as societies, we'll have to figure out how much of this we're really willing to tolerate. Mm. Um, I mean, we might find that there's regulations placed on companies that are doing data aggregation. Yeah. Uh, we might find that there's um, some limits placed on um, facial databases, for example, that are available to everyone as opposed to you know, just your own friend list. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, why is it that I should have sort of access to your list of, of friends' faces in addition to my own? So my sense is that democratic societies will have some availability of regulation and other sort of uh, means to limit this erosion of the separation between private and public spheres. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think Mikhail rightly points out that in some societies that is less likely. Mm -hmm. Uh, for there, I think we need to work on technology development that we can make available to others. Uh, the United States actually has a tradition of developing anonymization technologies and making them available to other countries, um, and I suspect that will continue. Uh, like the Tor browser. Right. Yeah. Um, that, of course, has its, its own um, unwanted side effects as well, so we as a society will have to figure out where to, where to strike the balance. It, it's very interesting what you say about these um, commercial uh, aggregators of very large data sets <laughs> about very large numbers of people. And uh, listening to you, it strikes me that it may be the case that um, that sort of uh, collection of information about people by the government is much more highly regulated and covered by existing law than uh, this commercial activity um, that is I think fairly that's right. unregulated. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's right. I mean, um, the, um, uh, the private sector, uh, we sort of like all signed the user agreements without reading them. Uh, but they do have an extraordinary amount of, of data, and that data is combined in ways that are quite powerful. Um, and the, the academic research on this has showed ways that it's, it's maybe even more powerful than, um, than we had originally recognized with things like the Netflix uh, prize uh, data sets where you could de-anonymize it from data that was publicly released. Hmm. So what's, um, what's becoming a real challenge is how can, you, how can you provide any guarantees on a data set that you make public that you couldn't de-anonymize it? Hmm. This is an important topic for things like human subjects research. Right. Um, where you're, um, you may be releasing what you think is anonymized data, but then you find out later there would have been ways of combining it with other data sets to de-anonymize. 
it's a, it's a very challenging area, and we need to approach it both with technology as well as with policy. Mm. Well, we have, uh, we have some questions from our audience that I'd like to uh, pose to you. Um, the, f the first of which is the question, uh, what role might blockchain play in government and, um, and in national security work? Well, blockchain is, is such an interesting technology for so many reasons. I actually think one of the strongest applications is to do um, uh, uh, trusted um, uh, finance in developing markets um, that don't have uh, reliable banking systems. Um, and I know that um, USAID and NGOs, World, the World Bank, and uh, some of the UN organizations are looking at blockchain for those kinds of applications. I think it's, it's, a, it's a deeply powerful application for that technology. Hmm. Um, our next question is, uh, do you collaborate or work with governments or companies outside of the US? We do. We fund research in over a dozen countries, um, and we uh, fund research not only at foreign universities, but also at foreign companies. We collaborate with foreign governments, um, especially what are known as the Five Eyes, um, which are the um, United States, the United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, but we also uh, collaborate with um, other members of, of NATO, um, and we um, help to, in, in their cases where we're funding research that is of, of clear benefit to things like public health organizations or organizations that are monitoring for um, societal instability or economic instability, we try to make those technologies then available to NGOs. I mean, to give a couple of examples, some of the work that we've done on video analytics has been used by uh, human rights organizations to identify human rights abuses, it's mm. being used um, uh, uh, to identify uh, urban violence. Um, and then some of the work that we've done in, um, in bibliometric analysis was just purchased by Mark Zuckerberg um, <laughs> to, uh, to make freely available through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, to try to accelerate biomedical research by doing text analysis of publications and patents. Hmm. We love it when stuff like that happens. If we can see some positive spillover from this research, into the other domains of society that have net benefits. Uh, that's, that's something that um, makes the job that much better for all of us. Uh, are, there, are there other examples of that kind of um, spillover or spin out that, um, that really have struck you as, as interesting or meaningful in, in some way? Yeah, I think um, a lot of our work in uh, disease forecasting um, has made use of unconventional data sets that, um, that epidemiologists like me had not looked at before. So to give one example, uh, we funded some work at Virginia Tech and Harvard uh, Health Map uh, to look at whether you could find early indicators of disease outbreaks through um, the kind of digital exhaust that is left in societies. So, like when people change their behaviors because they're sick, um, they leave their cell phones at home instead of the cell phones going to work and back. Mm. Um, they uh, may cancel their dinner dates or their travel reservations. Um, you can see from overhead imagery crowding at pharmacies or clinics. So in places where we don't have a whole lot of on-the-ground health um, information, for example, in developing countries, you can start using these methods and getting much earlier detection of disease outbreaks, and that's been shared with uh, international health organizations. In fact, one of, um, one of the teams that we funded at Harvard was the first to detect the uh, West Africa Ebola outbreak wow. by using those sorts of techniques. Um, and you can detect outbreaks weeks sooner than you would using normal uh, you know, uh, epidemiological methods. Is that spreading as a practice in epidemiology? I think there's much more recognition that we need to rely on more than just people reporting to doctors or pharmacies, um, that you need to um, use these sorts of unconventional uh, correlates of, of disease. Um, and I think we as a society will get probably smarter about, um, about using those. I, I mean, I continue to think that diseases are one of the biggest threats that we face as a society. If you look back historically, um, the most intense mortality event in human history 
was the 1918 flu. It mm -hmm. killed somewhere between 50 to 100 million people in a 12-month period, uh, more than any war. Um, and that could happen again, and it would probably be even larger um, as an event, and we're, we're just not as prepared as we should be. Do you have any programs that touch on the subject of climate change? Uh, well, we have some programs that do um, uh, geospatial observation to understand how things are changing on the surface of the Earth. We do a lot of collaboration with NGA in order to do better identification of imagery. And then we also have programs that look at changes in migration mm. uh, that could be influenced by climate change. Uh, you mentioned the, the, the Five Eyes Nations and NATO. Uh, it, the question occurred to me, is there an IARPA equivalent in any of those countries? Yeah, there, you know, it's, it's interesting. The DARPA model has been so extraordinarily successful. I mean, mm. if, if you list all of the technologies that DARPA helped to generate, um, I mean, first, many of the um, objects in the collection here um, came, out, came out of DARPA programs. And yet, it is a model that outside of the United States has not been widely replicated. Um, so, I mean, we've been deeply fortunate at, at IARPA to use that model and have seen how fruitful it is. Um, but we have, we have not seen other organizations outside of the U.S. use that model. Interesting. Um, we talked about kind of neuromorphic and uh, brain-inspired computing. Um, this question is essentially about um, the use of biology for computing. There's work now on using uh, DNA molecules as a form of uh, digital information storage. Uh, other groups have uh, been talking about using biological systems to compute. Uh, where's IARPA in that mix? That's such a rich area for, for research. Uh, we organized a workshop uh, two years ago uh, to look at DNA for information storage um, because um, you could store about an exabyte of data and about a gram of DNA. Um, and it was, it was such a wonderful workshop. I mean, we had um, people from the synthetic biology community, people from information theory and computing, uh, people from industry, people from academia. So I think we'll be doing more on that. Um, and then there's also very exciting work in using um, uh, biomolecules not only for information storage, but also for information processing. Right. So use chemistry for compute. Um, there's a, a great new program at, um, at DARPA on uh, molecular informatics. Um, and there's been some, some great work at Microsoft and other places looking at sort of the, the fundamental information processing that happens molecularly. Thinking back to the story you were telling about your, your route into this uh, whole world from public health and, and the, the kind of um, de novo designed virus uh, and, and concerns about that, I wondered if um, the CRISPR technology uh, for allowing, um, you know, affording great new capacities to do genetic engineering, I'll just call it. Um, does, does CRISPR and its potential keep you up at night? Yeah, I mean, I think CRISPR is uh, one of many new powerful tools um, that are in the toolkit now uh, of biologists. And we see new ones appearing every few months uh, that seem to be even more powerful than the last. Biology is undergoing this extraordinary um, period of advancement. Um, and at rates that are even faster than Moore's law. I mean, if you look at um, the cost per base pair synthesized or sequenced uh, with DNA, um, it's, it's faster than Moore's law um, in the, the uh, performance curves. Um, and the upside potential of that is enormous. Mm -hmm. So the, the benefits to human health, uh, to animal health, to agriculture, to biomaterials, to energy, all of those are extraordinary. Um, the downside potential is accidents that could be catastrophic and are hard to predict. <laughs> um, the intentional acts uh, that could be catastrophic and that wouldn't require nations to carry out, but could just be an individual um, who is a sophisticated misanthrope and decides to do something really horrible mm. um, and has the means to. 
Um, so we do have programs at IARPA that are focused on just that problem. Uh, one called uh, FungiCat, run by John Julius, uh, analyzes DNA sequences to assess their risk. Hmm. So even if it's a DNA sequence that nobody's seen before because it's completely novel, can you apply machine learning to sort of the classes of genes that you know something about in order to know whether this gene is one you should worry about? And then we have a new program called Felix, run by um, Amanda Dion Schultz, that's looking at the artifacts that are created from engineered genomes or, or oh, edited yes. genomes. Um, I think this is a, a very important area, and it's, it is probably the area that keeps me up at night most. Mm. Um, although I think I probably worry more about accidents than I do about intent. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Um, could we just go into that uh, Felix program? Is that I, I, I thought that was a very fascinating idea that there might be uh, signatures, traces, uh, detectable signals of uh, material um, that represent genetically engineered materials. Um, could you talk more about about that program and and yeah. and what some of the potential signals might be? Well, Amanda's brilliant, and like you know, most of our program managers, she came to IARPA because she wanted to solve this problem. Mm. And, she, um, and she's gotten some, um, some really outstanding scientists and engineers from around the world interested in this problem. We have an a, a, a impoverished toolkit to do forensics on engineered organisms. So, if, if you presented me with an organism, and please don't, <laughs> uh, but if you presented me with one, uh, I would um, be hard pressed to tell whether it had been engineered, um, how it had been engineered, in what way it had been engineered, um, because we don't have the kinds of forensics that we need in order to do that kind mm. of determination. So Felix is really aimed at starting to build that toolkit for forensics. Um, to look at things like methylation sites and off-target effects of things like CRISPR, um, but to also look at more subtle changes that might exist within a genome. The, the state of the science is so early yeah. right now on the forensic side. Um, the ability to edit genomes is much further ahead than the sort of defensive capabilities that we have, and part of the goal of this program is to catch up. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, a uh, question from the audience. Um, do you support any work on game theory? We have. We, um, as part of these geopolitical forecasting tournaments, um, one of the teams tested various uh, kinds of game theoretic approaches to making better forecasts of, um, say, political uh, decisions. Um, and there's some other work uh, that's been funded by um, uh, DARPA and their IQs program that's looked at, at game theory. I think that's, that can be a very powerful approach to understanding certain kinds of um, uh, high consequence decisions in which you're pretty sure that the relevant actors have been using game theory. Hmm. Um, it's less clear whether game theory provides a, um, an empirical explanation for how people actually behave um, because there's an awful lot of irrationality, right? And, um, so sort of the rational model that underpins game theory uh, doesn't always map to real human behavior. Mm. Um, but in cases where uh, people are investing millions or billions of dollars in making wise decisions, like say strategic um, uh, uh, decisions related to nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. that's where we really should be looking for evidence of those kinds of game theoretic calculations that are going on. And we do see that kind of evidence. I mean, um, Schelling and others, I mean, looked for that empirically, and you see it. Um, but in other cases, I think it's, it's a little blurrier, and I think um, probably we should be looking more at, um, at things like prospect theory, um, which allows for people to be irrational, which they often are. <laughs> yeah, it would seem to be a good theory of the human yeah. if it accounts for irrationality. Right. But that is fascinating to, to look and see a signature that somebody else is using game theory and then adopt a game theoretic response yourself once right. you realize you're in that kind of a game. And, and yeah, and if, you, if, you are, um, if you know that you're in a game with somebody who is following um, a game theoretic model, there are strategies that you use, like 
mix strategies in which you randomize certain moves and you try to alert the fact that you're randomizing certain moves to your adversary, it all gets really um, meta. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and thinking about a couple times you've mentioned uh, the names of people who are your program managers uh, at IARPA um, and the program manager for Felix that you just mentioned came in with this problem, wanted to do this wanted to do this program, solve this problem. Is that, is that typical of the way an IARPA program or investment in an area begins? Somehow you come into connection with a very passionate, you know, smart person who wants to tackle some problem or another. How does that work? How do these things get going? It starts one of two ways. So the, the first is it starts with a um, program manager and they're the whole reason we exist. I mean, the rest of us at IRPA, especially me, my only job is to protect the program managers from administrivia, from bureaucracy. Um, so I, I am just an umbrella over them so that they can operate and, and fund innovative research. Mm. Um, so, so they are idea generators and we hire them in order to pursue an idea that is important and that could have a huge impact on, on national intelligence. Um, the other source of ideas um, are the researchers and technologists in industry and academia. Um, and we depend on them for some of our best ideas that we would not have thought of ourselves. So we continuously um, uh, solicit those ideas. We have um, a, a solicitation for research proposals that's open all the time. I mean, it never closes. And people submit proposals to us all the time. Um, so we're continuously reviewing new ideas. Uh, people are calling us or sending us emails describing ideas that they think would have a, a huge impact and make us wiser and help us make better judgments as a, as a society. Um, so we, we depend on ideas from inside and ideas from outside. Um, but we, we would not be um, able to do anything without program managers and the outstanding scientists and engineers in industry and academia. There's just nothing else. I mean, that's, that's, that's why we exist. Do some of the program thrusts or, or uh, areas come percolate up from people working inside these constituent um, agencies of the intelligence community? You know, some analyst pulling out her hair <laughs> sitting in front of her computer monitor, you know, trying to make sense of something. Is there a way, do you have a mechanism for, for her concerns to bubble up? Yes. Um, so first is they can come to IARPA um, as, a, uh, as an assignment um, and spend a few years with us. Um, and I mean, Amanda actually is, is one of those examples. Uh, so she's a, a biologist from CIA who came to IARPA to work on this problem because she was confronting that problem um, at the agency. Mm. Um, and a lot of our program managers, maybe about a third of them, um, come in that way. Hmm. Um, another third of them might come from, um, from other government organizations, you know, like DARPA or NSF. Um, and then a third of them come from academia or, or industry. Um, and we, we take IPAs so that people get to keep their home appointment, say, as a professor at a university, and they can do a tour with us and then, then go back. It's, I think it's about the most fun that somebody could have on a sabbatical. Um, <laughs> granted, it's in Washington, D.C. It's a little less uh, pleasant in terms of weather right now than, <laughs> um, than Silicon Valley. Uh, but the, the other um, way that we uh, make sure that the concerns and needs from the agencies are addressed by IARPA is to go around and collect hard problem lists. So we go to each of those um, 17 agencies and we say, what are your hardest intelligence problems that if you had a technical solution to, um, it would give you um, a new tool to really solve an important intelligence mission? Um, and it's fascinating, the answers that we get back to that survey. Um, I mean, things related to detecting nuclear materials that are um, uh, very well shielded, to being able to detect um, emerging pathogens to um, being able to detect chemical weapons uh, that might or might not exist within a particular container. Um, and then we form programs around each of those. I mean, each of those that I just mentioned are ones that led to new research programs. 
I, I noticed that the list of um, the, some of the people who have won contracts from IARPA, um, in, in many instances, um, it is a, a, a familiar cast of characters um, in terms of like Raytheon BBN or um, established government and defense contractors are in many of these programs and, and, and um, many of whom have you know, directly applicable experience and expertise, of course. Um, uh, Raytheon BBN, BAE Systems, uh, Lockheed Martin, I think. Um, is there, and that made me wonder, you know, is there, is the government contracting process itself, does that, does that uh, limit the, num the sort of people who can work on these programs? You, you have to know how to do these contracts with the government and have people who have security clearances. So if I'm some small startup that maybe I think I have the best algorithm for doing this or that, um, how do I, Am I locked out in a way, or how do you address no. those concerns? So, um, so great question. If you look at our budget, um, a third of our research funding goes to universities and colleges. Um, another third goes to small businesses hmm. that most of us haven't heard of. Um, one sixth goes to large businesses, oh, really? like the, the type you mentioned. Um, and then another one sixth goes to national labs, um, other FFRDCs, government labs. Um, the, the reason why the, um, the large businesses often appear in sort of lists of you know, IRPA performers yeah. is one, they're the ones that put out press releases. Um, <laughs> number two, they're often prime contractors, which means that you might have a prime contractor like a large company that has 10 subcontractors and most of them might be universities. Right. Um, and they just don't get a whole lot of fanfare. Um, and I think that's unfortunate. We're trying to make sure that the small businesses and universities are mentioned on our webpage uh, with the programs that they work on, because um, they are getting most of the research funding. But all that said, it is true that government contracting can be highly annoying. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a whole lot of obstacles that shouldn't be there um, that we would love to find ways of streamlining. <laughs> Um, we have a few ways of doing creative acquisitions that are all legal, <laughs> um, but are really um, uh, accessible to smaller businesses or even to individuals. The primary one are prize challenges. Um, oh. So we use those frequently. We, I think we have um, four this year, um, and those are, um, those are challenges that we put out to the world, and we say, if anybody wants to solve this problem, you don't have to send a proposal, you don't have to sign a contract, um, you just submit a solution to this problem, and if yours is the winning solution, we'll give you money. <laughs> um, and we, you know, it's not like we show up with a duffel bag full of cash at your doorstep, or, or you know, with like the Ed McMahon giant check, um, but it's almost like that. Um, uh, so, so it's it's very convenient for folks who really don't have you know a federally approved accounting system or any of that. Right. Um, and there's there's huge participation rates. And one of our prize challenges, I think there were 500 uh, registrants, um, and you know the winning prize entry was like a hobbyist, you know, as somebody who was working in their basement on this problem. I love it when stuff like that happens. And I love it when the hobbyist wins and like the large defense contractor <laughs> is like number you know, 300. Yeah. It's, it's great to see um, the, the little guys uh, succeed in those. Uh, a question that I think is a fair question, but perhaps not one that uh, you can answer is, um, has IARPA changed under the Trump presidency? No. Uh, so, so I think um, DARPA, IARPA, RPE um, have, uh, have both uh, maintained their missions, their commitment to uh, funding uh, advanced research, uh, a commitment to scientific truth uh, and technical rigor. Um, it's been completely unaffected. Um, now, I mean, I know a lot of other issues are affected. 
Um, but we, um, uh, we have the, I, I really think you would not be able to tell the difference um, if you took a snapshot of us now and a snapshot of us six months ago. Mm. Um, perhaps a, a, a final question then would just be, you know, we've spent a lot of time talking about obviously the connection between um, intelligence and computing software, uh, the dependencies of all of these IARPA projects and programs, and by extension, the work of the intelligence community on software and computing. Um, where do you see that trend line moving in the future? Um, is that something that will, will continue, will, will grow? Uh, what's it look like looking ahead? Yeah, I think, um, so first I think the government will, um, will have to accept that um, it is now um, not the main funder of um, most of these technologies that are key to national intelligence and national security, mm -hmm. that we have to look um, to the investments that are happening in the commercial sector, for example, in machine learning, in order to understand how to adapt those investments to our problem sets. So being more agile in adapting those, I think places like InQtel, uh, which is sort of the private investment arm of the intelligence community, does an outstanding job in monitoring the startup world um, for things that could be relevant to national intelligence. Um, another place where I think the, um, the intelligence community needs to do a better job is in figuring out um, what are the problems that the commercial sector will not go after where mm -hmm. our funding is uniquely needed? Um, one of those I mentioned, which are things like low resource languages, right. which don't have markets. But another is like robustness to these adversarial inputs or adversarial machine learning. It's just not something that um, a whole lot of commercial uh, firms need to worry about. They don't have to worry about um, you know, people trying to um, uh, prevent an image classifier from recognizing what kind of cereal that is. <laughs> right. You don't have like smart cereal boxes that are trying to confuse an image classifier. Yeah. Um, but we do have you know tanks that are trying to confuse image classifiers. So we um, we as a community then will probably have to fund certain kinds of research that the commercial sector and academia won't fund on their own. Well, Jason, thank you very much for this um, fascinating discussion and introducing us to uh, IARPA. And um, won't you all join me in uh, thanking our guests? Thank you.